Welcome. This is a series about health economics to patient advocates. I'm Mark Molnár from Hungary, Budapest. I'm a medical doctor and an economist by background. I used to work at the Hungarian Office for Health Technology Assessment, and then I was responsible for the national drug, drug reimbursement system in my country. Hi, I'm David Danko. I'm also from Hungary. I'm an economist by background, and I have been into health technology assessment and health economics for 14 years. I also worked as a payer in Hungary. In this series, which has seven chapters, we will try to take you through main questions, main issues in health economics and health technology assessment from a perspective that you may use in communication and negotiation with stakeholders, with payers. Our goal is to take it, bring it closer to you in a pragmatic way, in an understandable way. So don't get scared. There will be a couple of numbers, figures, but we will make it easy for understanding. In the first chapter, I will talk about efficient patient advocacy based on my real life experiences. Welcome. In this short video, we will talk about impactful patient advocacy. Why? Because patient representatives and patient advocacy groups have an increasingly prominent role in healthcare decisions that governments, national health services, and sick funds across Europe take. There is an increasing attention from decision makers towards patient groups and the perspective from which they contribute to debates on healthcare. Of course, increasing interest means increasing opportunities, but also increasing responsibility. It is patient advocates' role and responsibility to bring the patient perspective close to decision makers, and this helps find solutions for better health outcomes. To use this opportunity and to manage this responsibility, patient advocates must bear in mind three absolutely important things. They must have a vision, they must be legitimate, and they must understand the language of decision makers. Let's have a look at each of these one by one. Vision. This means that you, as a patient advocate, must be able to tell decision makers how you would like to see the future of the therapy area you represent. You must also be able to know how your therapy area is related to other therapy areas. Legitimacy. This means that you, as a patient advocate, must be per perceived by decision makers and payers as an independent authority and a trusted decision partner discussion partner. Language. This means that you, as a patient advocate, must understand how decision makers think and what language they use. You may not want to speak their language, but you must understand it. Easy to say, hard to do. You may be tempted to comment, and you are quite right with that. All these three things have technical and, let's say, communicational aspects. As a former decision maker in pharmaceutical policy, I collected for you 11 principles that may give you some very practical advice on how to discuss and negotiate with your decision makers. Why 11? No exact reason, just these came to my mind to share with you. Being visionary starts with being knowledgeable about main unmet needs in your therapy area, both from clinical and social perspective. This is principle one. This will enable you to prioritize and focus your energies on really key issues. Then, you must be horizon scanners. This is principle two, and it means that you need to know which technologies are upcoming in your therapy area and how they are going to change it. Horizon scanning makes it possible for you to link new technologies to unmet need. Once you are familiar with unmet needs and upcoming technologies, you must have a clear imagination on what your therapy area should look like in one year, three years, and five years. These are the time horizons which most de decision makers follow, and you must be able to give them a vision for these time horizons. This was principle three. And the last principle related to the vision, principle four. Very easy, even trivial. Based on your one-year, three-year, and five-year vision, you must have clearly defined priorities. 
stop actions. I know this may sound to you a bit like a management cookbook, but believe me, this is how it works. Let's move on to legitimacy. Trust is often weak in healthcare, and so is it between decision makers and representatives of various stakeholder groups. To overcome the trust gap, perhaps the most important principle is that you must be an expert. You must have an informed opinion about healthcare, patient preferences and experiences, your therapy area and other therapy areas connected to your area. Principle five. Principle six is about visibility and impressions. Your patient advocacy group must be professionally managed, reachable, proactive and responsive. You can't afford not to have a good website. You can't afford not to pick up the phone when a decision maker rings you. And you should never ever have your office together with any commercial organization. This leads us over to principle seven, which says you need to secure sustainable and independent funding. This is crucial. If you don't follow this, you will be perceived as a fifth column, or to put it even more harshly, an agent for your sponsors. Principle eight may sound weird, but it addresses quite a common phenomenon in our region. You must avoid the multiplication of patient advocacy groups in the same disease area. People may why for power, positions, and influence, but as soon as competing advocacy groups represent one therapy area, they will not seem credible to decision makers. And a very practical thing, decision makers may not even want to spend their time with them. As said, you must also understand how decision makers think and what language they use. Let's see the principles that are related to decision makers' language. Insensitive as it may seem, decision makers tend to think in populations and not in individuals. Yes, if they could think in individuals, very likely they would take many more positive decisions. But they don't have the money for that. In fact, they have limited resources and this constrains them to say no sometimes. Actually, quite often. And more things to consider. They must be consistent. If they make a new treatment available for a patient, they must make it available for another patient too, if that patient has the same condition. This, forced, this, this forces decision makers to think about patients as populations. Principle nine. Most patient advocates are emotionally engaged in improving conditions for the patients they represent. I assume you are like that too but you need to know when to use emotions and when to use reasons. This is principle 10. If a decision maker already supports you, but he or she depends on others for, let's say, money or the amendment, the new amendment of the relevant re legislation, it is useless to put any emotional burden on them or with decision makers who are only interested in financial savings, your right strategy is to convince them that short-term savings may lead to higher long-term expenditures. They may listen to this and will almost certainly not listen to emotional arguments. And with that, we have arrived at our last principle 11. You need to understand how decision makers think and how they decide, but your role is not to follow their logic. If you understand their mindset and language, and if they trust you, you can point at the limits and weaknesses of their reasoning, and you may use this opportunity to reshape their objectives according to your objectives. And this is the most impactful patient advocacy that you can exist. Thank you very much for the attention.